I, w I want to thank, thank the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I am Arvind Patel, and I, like Alan Cole, also work at the Center of Virus Research. And the focus of my work is hepatitis C virus, which, as you know, belong uh, to the family Flaviviridae, just like the Zika virus. So just to give you a bit brief background uh, on hepatitis C virus, it is a hepatotropic, hepatotropic virus. Um, it's responsible for causing serious liver disease uh, worldwide. Um, it, it, it is highly genetically diverse virus with uh, seven different genotypes, and within each genotype, we have a number of subtypes. Um, there are now very effective treatments available against uh, for treating the virus infection. However, this, these treatments are very expensive and therefore not readily accessible to most of the patients. And as yet, there is no vaccine available. So uh, uh, vac development of vaccine is an active area of research in hepatitis C virus. So the virus infection is characterized by the initial uh, phase of uh, uh, acute uh, infection, which is largely asymptomatic. Uh, and a, a small number of uh, patients during the acute phase go on to uh, clear the virus spontaneously. But the majority of them go on to proceed to develop a chronic infection, which can progress to um, liver cancer, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, just, uh, uh, again, a brief background on the genomic organization of the virus. As I said, it belongs to uh, uh, the family Flaviviridae, but within uh, a genus Hepasivirus. Um, it's, it encodes a single-stranded RNA genome, um, uh, which codes for a polyprotein, which is processed in bits and pieces of functional units. Uh, among them, you have the uh, among them, you have the uh, E1 and E2 glycoproteins there, which are embedded into the virus particles uh, and which are essential for virus entry into cells. So E1 and E2 form a heterodimer, and this heterodimer complex is, is the functional unit of the virus particles. And there is not a lot of known about the E1 itself, but uh, we know quite a bit about the E2, and E2 has been shown to interact with receptors like CD81 and SRB1, and this interaction is absolutely essential for the virus to, to get into the cells. Um, more recently, uh, there has been a structure of a soluble form of E2 that's been determined, as shown here. It is, uh, uh, it is uh, overall a, a globular structure, very different from uh, uh, an extended uh, domain, three-domain-like uh, structure of, uh, for the flavi flavivirus uh, E proteins. So, um, and so, so there is a, so the, the interest that we have in our lab is to develop HCV vaccine. And there is a huge challenge in developing a vaccine against hepatitis virus simply because uh, uh, it, it is a highly diverse virus, genetically diverse virus, and therefore uh, producing a vaccine that will be applicable to all the isolates is going to be uh, uh, proving very challenging. So, so an, an effective virus will need to focus their immune response uh, on the conserved uh, functionally important regions that are normally poorly immunogenic. Uh, so, uh, and therefore, a structure-based approach is uh, required, and the epitopes of broadly neutralizing antibodies therefore provide a useful lead for vaccine, decide, uh, vaccine design. And this is the approach that we are, we are using. We are using an epitope-focus, um, developing an epitope-focus vaccines uh, to generate antibodies that would neutralize virus infection. So um, uh, for this short presentation, I'm going to focus on one of the antibodies that I've been working on for a long time. Uh, here is just a, a, uh, a linear representation of the E2 glycoprotein itself, and I've highlighted three regions within E2 which have been shown to bind to, um, uh, shown to be essential for binding of E2 to CD81. Um, and therefore, th these regions are essential for virus entry into uh, cells. And, and the amino acid residues that are underlined are the residues that are absolutely critical for the interaction between E2 and CD81. So I'm going to focus my kind of talk uh, on just the region one here. Um, and and it, there, there have been several antibodies binding to this particular region have been identified. And among them, um, we have uh, one called um, AP33 here. Um, which, is, which, which has been subject of a research in our lab for a long, long time. It was generated in our lab in a, in a mouse model. Uh, all these antibodies 
have epitopes residues that are overlapping but distinctive, but all what, what they all what did, sorry uh, what they have one one thing in common is uh, the tryptophan residues uh, at position four to zero. They all require this particular residue for binding to to E2, and this residue also happens to be the residue that is required for binding of E2 to CD81. Okay, so. Um, so here is again an epitope of E2 um, shown, uh, which is located between a two highly variable region of E2, um, and the epitope itself is very highly conserved, and therefore the, the antibody AP33 is able to neutralize virus infection or, uh, or infection of viruses with all different, all six or seven different genotypes, as, as shown in this particular graph here. We have uh, a neutralization assay using a surrogate particle system, which we call is SCVPP. Um, bearing envelope glycoproteins for six different genotypes, and they are all neutralized in a dose-dependent fashion. And the, the antibody is also able to neutralize uh, our, our authentic virus infection uh, and, and the cell culture. Okay, and more recently we've tested this antibody in an animal model here in collaboration with Philip Muleman at Ghent University. He has developed this UPA, UPA skid mouse model um, uh, which is a human liver chimeric uh, mouse model. Um, and what we did was we infused the animals uh, either with a placebo or, or uh, uh, an antibody AP33 or another antibody that binds to the same uh, epitope called 311. So there were four animals that were infused with these antibodies and then they were challenged three days after infusion with a clinical strain of hep C. And what we can show is that three out of four animals were completely protected by AP33. And it was actually, a converse was true for this particular antibody, uh, 311, where three of, only one of the animals was protected. The three came down with infection, just like uh, in placebo. So what this experiment shows that the antibody AP33 quite works, works very well in, in uh, an in vivo setting, uh, which is important for hep C because hep hepatitis C virus itself uh, in, in uh, patient is associated with all sorts of things among them, lipoparticles, lipo lipoprotein particles. So it's possible that um, uh, lipoproteins can mask the epitopes of interest, but in this case, um, uh, AP33 was sh shown quite clearly to be efficiently uh, protecting the animal from infection. So um, uh, for, for this reason, because of the properties of these antibodies, uh, it, is, it, is, it is of interest for in terms of developing a vaccine. As I said, we have a structure of E2, uh, but unfortunately, this particular epitope um, was not actually shown to be present in the structure. It was, it was, it was found to be disordered, uh, as shown here at the end terminus. So we, we, did, we, we couldn't actually decipher the structure of that particular bit on, on this uh, E2 protein. However, um, several, several of the antibodies binding to that epitope has been crystallized when bound to the pep peptide. So uh, one of them is AP33, which we did ourselves, as shown here. Uh, and the two other structures, all three of them show that the peptide adopts uh, a beta herpin structure, as shown here. Sorry, I don't know what I've done. Comes. Yeah, so, uh, so the, the, the peptide is a, a, a actually able to fold itself uh, and, and be stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Uh, however, um, recently, uh, the two of the other antibodies binding to the same epitope have also been crystallized, and what they show is that the epitope adopts a slightly different open conformations, as shown here uh, at the bottom. So what this suggests together is that this particular epitope is very flexible when it's present on the E2 glycoprotein, and it adopts a specific structure depending on what it binds to. Okay. So we, we initially, when we, we were interested in producing a vaccine that would uh, elicit antibodies to this particular epitope, so we, we uh, immunized animals um, with, with this peptide and found that um, that it didn't work, basically. So the peptide was not effective in generating a, a, a vaccine or, or, or generating antibodies that would neutralize virus infection. So we use a different approach. We use uh, the antibody itself, um, AP33, uh, as a template to reverse engineer an uh, immunogen uh, using an anti id type approach. So the anti id type approach is based on the fact that uh, this anti antigen binding site here 
is recognized by the immune system as a set of uh, uh, idiotypic epitopes or idiotopes. So uh, uh, an anti-idiotype antibody to the primary antibody we call ARB1 uh, is called, so the, the, the anti-idiotype antibody is called ARB2, as shown here, and there are a subset, subset of ARB2 known as ARB2-beta are, are uh, uh, expected to have antigen binding sites which, which fit perfectly with the antigen binding site of the original antibody, and therefore this antigen binding site of the anti-idiotypic antibodies would represent or, or mimic the E2 epitope cell. So when you use this antibody to then immunize animals, you can, what you can do is you can produce uh, an anti, anti idiotypic antibodies, what we call is um, ARP3. And these antibodies are, very, uh, are expected to be very similar in properties to the original antibodies. Uh, in that uh, it will bind to E2 in the same way uh, as, as the original antibody. So we, we immunize animal uh, mice uh, with, uh, sorry, uh, I'm just being confused, with this anti-idiotypic antibodies and produce a panel of um, uh, anti-idiotypic antibodies. But the challenge for us was to identify a true anti-idiotype uh, in terms of, uh, in a sense that um, Identifying the ARB2 beta was proving very, very difficult. So what we did was we used the structure of the, of the primary antibodies, and we mutated uh, the residues of the antibody, which are located into the antibody binding site, uh, antibody binding pocket, uh, individually to alanine. And we tested, the, tested those mutated antibodies, each of them, uh, to, for binding to E2. And what we found was that uh, there were eight residues within the AP33 antibody that were essential for binding of AP33 to E2. And then what we did was we screened the panel of anti-idiotypic anti antibodies that we had for binding to these mutated antibody molecules. And what we found was that, as shown in the bottom, there are several uh, subsets of those antibodies actually weren't affected by these mutations at all. So what, what it was showing to us was that these antibodies were not binding to the antigen, antigen binding sites um, uh, of the primary antibody. Going up the ladder, we, we were finding some antibodies that were, that were requiring one or two of several of these residues, but the best candidate was this, this candidate called B2.1A, which required all eight of them uh, for binding or recognition uh, to the ori original antibodies. So we, we, we reckoned that this particular antibody would, would be the true up to beta. And we used that antibody to immunize animals. And we, we found that the animals were secreting um, or, or eliciting antibodies that were anti-E2. So then we ne the next step, step for us was to find out what they were binding to, what part of the E2. So, 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 so what we did was we, we carried out a, a peptide competition ELISA whereby we tested the immune sera from the animals immunized with the up to beta, B2.1A, uh, and tested, that, tested, tested them for binding to E2 in the presence of varying concentration of the peptide itself, the peptide representing the epithelial epitope. epitope. As, as you can see, the peptide was quite clearly able to inhibit uh, binding of this sera to, uh, to E2 in a dose-dependent fashion, as it did uh, and as it, expect, as it was expected uh, of the AP33 as well. So, so it was quite clear that the, the, the up to beta or the B2.1A was generating an, an immune response which was very similar to AP33 in nature. And we then went on to further confirm the epitope requirement itself down to the amino acid levels by, um, by screening um, a, a panel of alanine scanning mutants across the AP33 epitope, as you can show, as you can see here, for binding to uh, binding of those antibodies to the mut mut mutant proteins, and as expected with AP33, um, we found that these mutants were essential for binding uh, to the antibody, and similarly, uh, the two uh, um, animals that were immunized with the anti-idiotypic antibodies also produce a sera that had the similar requirements to that of AP33 in terms of binding uh, or recognition of, of the epitope residues itself. So clearly we were, we were producing an, a, a, a vaccine that is very epitope focused. 
So what we are doing now is, um, and, and then, then we went on to show that these sera are actually also able to neutralize virus infection in a dose-dependent fashion, similar to AP33 itself. Um, and and uh, IC50 values of, of the, 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 the immune sera were very close to AP33 itself. They were about two to three-fold lower than AP33. So at the moment, what we're doing is to actually validate this particular vaccine candidate in an in vivo mouse model. So apart from the AP33, uh, so another thing we wanted to do was to actually try and understand the molecular basis of the antigenic mimicry uh, of, of this B2.1A antibody, uh, anti d type candidate. So what we did was we, uh, in collaboration with a, a group in St. Andrews, Gary Taylor's group, we crystallized uh, the B2.1A uh, antibody when it was bound to AP33. Uh, and the, the, the structure of that antibody is shown here. Um, uh, and then we compared uh, the, the antibody binding pocket of the B2.1A with the epitope residue itself when it's bound to, to the primary antibody. And when, when we um, superimpose the two, what we find is that uh, there is a very great deal of similarities between, between the two structures, although there's no similarities at, at the sequence level. As shown in this blown up picture, where uh, um, the W420, or the tryptophan at position 420, uh, is mimicked by a phenyl alanine in the heavy um, CDR3 of the heavy chain, whereas the two other residues uh, of E2 that are required for AP33 recognition uh, are replaced by uh, a tyrosine uh, chair side chain. So apart from the AP33, there are, there are quite a lot of um, other antibodies that we've been working with, uh, and we are interested in developing, again, uh, uh, an epitope-focused vaccines that would induce antibodies to those epitopes. And, and some of them are listed here. Some of these antibodies, are, these are all human antibodies, and they've been well characterized, and they've been shown to bind uh, to um, uh, uh, different regions of E2, and they all, uh, all bind to, to residues that are absolutely essential for E2 CD81 interaction. So all these antibodies inhibit virus infection because they inhibit uh, E2 in, uh, interaction of E2 with CD81. But as you can see, unlike AP33, which binds to the linear uh, uh, peptide, all these antibodies uh, have a discontinuous epitope uh, uh, on, on a linear E2 molecule. So, so they are conformational in, uh, in nature. So while these epitopes are discontinuous on a, on a linear molecule, when you look at uh, their position on a folded molecule, you can see uh, that the CD81 binding regions are quite close, uh, present, closely present to each, other, uh, uh, to each other. And therefore, that would explain how these antibodies function in neutralization assay. So at the moment, what we're trying to do is to develop immunogens that would mimic these epitopes in such a way that then they will elicit antibodies that would be broadly neutralizing in nature, uh, and, and hopefully that would constitute a, a, a true vaccine candidate. So just to summarize, um, we have used a, a broadly neutralizing antibody, AP33, as a template to reverse en engineer an immunogen that induces a similar antibody upon vaccination. And this has been achieved by isolating an anti idiotopic antibody, um, which represents an internal image of the primary antibody, AP33. Uh, an X-ray crystallography shows that the CDR3 um, uh, of the heavy chain of that particular antibody mimics the epitope. Um, so, uh, and, and then vaccination of the mice with this particular anti idiotopic antibodies um, uh, produce or elicits antibodies that are very specific um, for uh, the, the epitope 1 region um, uh, that can neutralize the virus uh, in cell culture. So now we are testing this candidate uh, in, in, a, in an animal model to see whether, whether uh, it will, we could validate these results at all. And at the moment now we are also trying to develop immunogens that, are mimic, mimic, that mimic other broadly neutralizing epitopes uh, as vaccine targets. And finally, just to uh, acknowledge um, People in my lab, past and present, Anya Oshanka, uh, Nathan, and, and Katrina, and also our collaborators in the University of St. Andrews, Gary Taylor, Jane Porter, and Valeria, and our collaborators at the University of Ghent, Philip, Philip Muleman, and Thomas Baumert at Strasbourg University, who did the animal work. Thank you very much. <laughs>